This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. Ahead of a special announcement coming later this week, we sat down with Kevin M. Jones, the William Edward McElfresh Professor of Physics Emeritus at Williams College and a program manager in the Division of Physics here at the National Science Foundation to learn a little bit about antimatter. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Jones. I want to start with one of the basics here. What is antimatter? The simplest atom is a hydrogen atom. It's a proton in the middle, an electron going around the outside. And if we just think about the electron for a minute, special relativity tells us that because that electron has mass, it has energy. This is the most famous equation in physics, E equals mc squared. Mass is a form of energy. And we can convert different kinds of energy into mass and vice versa. So we can also think about visible light like we see here. That visible light comes in the form of little particles that we call photons. But the energy in a visible photon is much less than the energy that electron has in its mass. But if we go up to shorter wavelengths of light, ultraviolet, X-rays, and we get to something that we call gamma rays, but they're really just light, those come in big, beefy photons. And those photons, for example, you can detect with a Geiger counter. You can see them one at a time, bang, 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 through a Geiger counter. And a photon like that can have more energy than the mass of the electron. And so if you take this big, beefy photon and it's coming along with all this energy, if it hits, say, a nucleus of an atom, it can lose some momentum there and produce two particles with the mass of the electron. But they won't be two electrons. So one of them will be an electron with a negative charge, and one will be a particle that we call positron with a positive charge. And they're always produced in these pairs. And so those two particles kind of always come together. There's, so they're sort of like partner particles, although we don't call them that. What we call them is one is a particle and one is the antiparticle. So the electron is the antiparticle of the positron and the positron is the antiparticle of the electron. So they're really, they're a pair of particles that share many characteristics. They're, they're not identical, you can tell them apart. So the electron has a negative charge, positron has a positive charge, and so if you put them for example, into a magnetic field, one goes around one way, one goes the other way. And so we can distinguish them. That's in fact how positrons were first discovered. Antimatter is really just another kind of particle that's there all the time in, in that simple picture. And so you can take, for example, you could take a hydrogen atom again with a proton and an electron and replace the proton. The protons also have antiparticles and we call them antiprotons. So if you take the proton, replace it with an antiproton. It'll have the opposite charge, but it's otherwise like a proton. And you take the electron, replace it with a positron. You have the same electrical forces because you've swapped the, the charges on the two particles. And so that's held together as an atom, just like an ordinary hydrogen atom, except the particles are replaced with their antiparticles. And so we call that antihydrogen. In that view, these things are all kind of equivalent. They're all sort of fundamental particles. They're produced equally. They have not identical properties, but they have these sort of mirror properties in a way. In that little universe, there really isn't any distinction between particles and antiparticles. Because they're produced in pairs, there's like, you get one of these, you get one of those. But when we come back to the universe that we live in, <laughs> and not just the simple version, you look around and you say, okay, what do I see around me? Everything you see is made out of electrons. Us. Everything you touch is atoms that are made out of electrons. And you say, well, where are the positrons? Because weren't they all produced at the same time? That is a very profound question that we don't know the answer to. This is a great mystery in physics is why is the universe, as far as we know, made almost entirely out of what we call ordinary matter, which is just half of this pair of particles that, that we think fundamentally are always produced together. Why is antimatter so rare? Well, as I told you, we don't really know the answer to that. Uh, so uh, if you can answer that, you're going to win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> In the fundamental processes, as we understand them, it should basically be producing equal amounts of matter and antimatter. What happens when antimatter and matter come into contact with each other? They immediately convert into photons. If you get a positron and an electron come together, you get these, this very distinctive decay of, of two photons, each of which has an energy that has the same energy as the mass of the electron and one the mass of the 
positron, which are the same. So the, it's a very distinctive signature. And so you can see, for example, undergraduate physics lab experiment is to take a source of high energy photon, a radioactive source, and put it next to a lead brick. <laughs> and that lead brick, some of those photons will go in and produce uh, positrons and electrons. The electrons just go in, there's like a gazillion electrons in there you'd never notice. But that positron will very quickly then find an electron. Those will annihilate, and you'll get this distinctive pattern of back-to-back -back photons coming out, which you can detect. How powerful is that reaction? Could you use that energy? So, yeah. So, I mean, that's a good question. So, certainly, I mean, my first introduction to antimatter was from watching Star Trek, and it was that's how it powers the Enterprise. Uh, so, there's always this sort of, you know, thought of, like, could you use it? So, in some sense, the answer is if you have a certain like a kilogram of electrons and a kilogram of positrons, they have exactly the same energy so in them. And, and so there really isn't a distinction between ordinary matter and antimatter in terms of what they have in them. Um, but if you bring them together, you can completely convert that mass into energy. And so there's a huge potential energy, amount of energy that can be released there. It's half in the electrons and half in the positrons. So it's not like it's all in the antimatter somehow. There is some, in some sense, they're exactly the same, but there's this opportunity to completely convert the mass into energy. Whereas in an ordinary chemical reaction, for example, if you take two hydrogen atoms and bring them together to make a hydrogen molecule, that releases some energy. If you were to compare the mass of the two hydrogen atoms to the mass of the molecule, you'd find the molecule actually weighs a little less because you converted some of the energy into uh, it was released. And so it's, I mean, you're never going to see this like weighing things out on a chemical balance. But uh, if you very precisely measure all the constituent particles and so forth, we can now tell that in fact the mass of the hydrogen molecule has to be less. Uh, but it's a tiny fraction, maybe a billionth of the mass gets converted into energy. If you do a fusion reaction like in the sun and you take hydrogen atoms and combine them to produce uh, helium and some other things. Uh, and you could look, were to look there, much more of the initial mass has been converted into energy, maybe a million times more, a larger energy output. But it's still, if you were to look, you know, 99.9% .9 of the mass is still there. And so if you imagine, again, you're trying to make a rocket engine or something, burning hydrogen, which is what we do now, or equivalent, you basically take a very, very tiny fraction of, of the energy that was there in the form of mass and convert it into useful energy. If you could build a fusion rocket, which no one's done, <laughs> um, then that would be more efficient in using the fuel. And so the dream is if you had an antimatter, you could take all of the energy in the mass. You would need very little fuel compared to even your fusion rocket to uh, do it. Now, the hard part is if you really just take electrons and positrons and put them together, is that what you get is gamma rays coming out. So that's not gonna make your rocket go forward. So somehow, if you wanna make a rocket go this way, you have to get momentum to go out the back of the rocket that way. And there, so there's a, let's say there's an engineering challenge to be overcome there to imagine making a useful uh, rocket motor. But conceptually, carrying a little bit of antimatter would be like the most efficient way you could have to sort of use all of the energy that's available. Ultimately, why is it important to understand antimatter? We think that it's going to tell us something very fundamental about the basic properties of the universe. In particular, this sort of theory we have about how these particles are always produced in pairs and so forth, which is, is really a small piece of what's called the standard model of particle physics. And we describe many, many things that we see in accelerators and so forth. But we know it's somehow incomplete because A, it doesn't explain why the universe is mostly matter rather than equal amounts of matter and antimatter. And there's some other things also that it doesn't, we know about that it doesn't explain, but we don't know why. You know, if you're asked, is it a practical problem? No. no. I mean, we have the universe we have, you know, and we can just say live with it. But I'd say curiosity is like, this has always been the drive to understand the world we see around us and to, to really keep probing the fundamentals from, we go back at one point, you know, we had fire, water, air, and earth or whatever, or the elements. And we, you know, people kept pushing and they realized, well, no, no, that's not really, I mean, we can break those things down. And really we, we've learned about atoms and then we learned about what was inside atoms. So this is continuing that, 
long-standing quest, I would say, to really understand the world around us. Special thanks to Kevin M. Jones. For The Discovery Files, I'm Nate Potker. Please subscribe wherever you get podcasts, and if you like our program, share with a friend and consider leaving a review. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov.